are good to see each and every one of you here this morning for this wonderful day we can be together. Remember what Jesus has done for us as we just did. And also learn from his word. There's a passage that Paul wrote to the church at Rome where he said that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So this morning I want to give an, a lesson from the past, from the life of David. David was willing to do something that no one else in Israel was willing to do. And when he did that, he ended up eventually becoming a fugitive because of what he did. And eventually we get to this point where he's a refugee, he's a fugitive at the uh, springs of Engedi. And the thing that he did, the one thing that he did by faith, he had faith in God to do this, that no other Israelite soldier was willing to do. He fought the champion of the Philistines, Goliath. He was ridiculing the Israelites and their God, and David defeated the giant. Everyone else was afraid to fight because he stood not about nine feet, six inches tall. And that man is pictured there's not even tall enough. Nine feet, six inches tall. And when David defeated him, the Israelites rejoiced, and the women began to sing. And they were singing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Well, when you read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we read this, that Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, and he thought, but me with only thousands, what more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Saul now had no respect for David. He disdained him. He couldn't stand him. And how is jealousy pictured in this proverb? Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming. But who can stand against or stand before jealousy? When you see that, the very beginning of this, anger is cruel, fury is overwhelming. That is the way that, that Saul became. It's kind of like this guy going down the highway. And he's got some road rage. Do you see how he's kicking that car? And then what happens, kind of a cascade effect of hitting a pickup and, and all of those. And the guy just goes on down the road. That was most likely road rage. And I can just picture Saul in that way with David. He's got road rage against David for what he's done. That's what jealousy does to a person. He was ready to kill him. And so after Saul heard them singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul and began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp of the liar, as he was told to do before. He would have these episodes, and he was coming in and calming. But Saul had a spear in his hand that day, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall, in other words, to kill him. But David escaped him, escaped him twice. A tormenting spirit is what happens with jealousy. God honors our choices, whether they're good or bad. If you choose jealousy, that's not healthy. And that's what's happening to, to King Saul here. When Saul offered his daughter Michael to David in marriage, he was going to do it once David went out and killed 100 Philistines. He wanted him to go out and do that, not actually to kill him, but to be killed by them. When he comes back, he defeats them. 
In fact, we're told that God is with him, gives him success in whatever he does. And so he marries Michael. Michael hears about a plot that, that Saul is scheming. And when David is in bed that night, he's going to have him killed. Well, Michael hears about the, the plot. And she warns him, so he escapes. And that night is the night he became a fugitive, running for his life against King Saul. And later we find that he usually would come to this meal. He didn't show up. And Jonathan is there. Jonathan's already met him in private and secret with David. And David is telling him his father intends to kill him. Well, he didn't really believe him, but at that meal, since David's not there, and it seems like Jonathan is defending David, but why should he be put to death? Jonathan asked his father. What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan, intending to kill him. So at last, Jonathan realized that his father was ready, really determined to kill David. Well, if his father is ready to kill his own son, it's pretty obvious he's determined to kill David. These events bring us to the cave at the oasis of Engedi. David and his men are hiding as fugitive in a large cave. And David is in the desert of Engedi. Look for, look for David, he's told by others. Look for David and his men near the crags, these steep cliffs of the wild goats. And the goats look like that. They're not these little, little fuzzy things that we normally think of. But David and his men were far back in the cave. Psalm 54, there's several psalms that tell about what was happening to David at this time. Psalm 54 tells of David's betrayal by the Ziphites. He and his men had saved them from the Philistines. But the Ziphites, they turned right around and they tell Saul about David and where he might be. Worst of all, Psalm 56 describes David's flight to the Philistine town of Gath. He goes, he's desperate, he's alone, he's afraid, and he goes to the Philistine city of Gath and he kind of acts like a, a madman there. And eventually he's able to, to leave and goes to a large cave known as Adullam. And while he was there, his brothers and others of his family household in distress, others who are in distress, they come to David. Several hundred men go, and David becomes their leader. And then when you get to Psalm 57, it doesn't speak of him hiding from his enemies at Gad or in the wilderness of the Ziphites. But here he's hiding in God, which is what the cave comes to symbolize. And the cave described in the title, Psalm 57, may be the one at Engedi, not at Adam. This psalm seems to fit with what happened there. So what did he write and sing? There. Well, David and his men are back in the cave there, and all of these events take place. And we see he's near the crags of the wild goats. And the title of Psalm 57 says that when he, that is David, fled from Saul in, in the cave, a plea to God, when you read this psalm, is a plea to God for his mercy. He will hide in God. Not his problems. Not going to hide in his problems. Have mercy on me, he writes. And you would sing it. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. How do we take refuge in God? Well, I think that as you continue to go through the story, you're going to find out how David took refuge in God. And we're going to learn that shortly. And so David writes this psalm about what happens in the cave of the Gedi, and later he would be singing it. And so David writes, and we find all of these things that transpire there, and the reason they transpire there is because David has an enemy. It's Saul. But Saul doesn't have an enemy. 
Because David is not his enemy. He's not treating him like you would suspect that an enemy would treat someone. So Saul is jealous of David after all of his military victories, considering him a threat to his throne. So David becomes a fugitive, running for his life. And Saul's pursuit of David consumes him. It just consumes him. And when David and his men escaped several times for refuge, safety, and rest, they eventually go to the oasis of Engedi. But, again, Saul discovers their location and he pursues them with 3,000 of his best soldiers. 3,000 of them. Now, Engedi is about 35 miles southeast of Jerusalem. It's an oasis of 250 acres. It's, uh, there are springs there, about four springs that are located there at this oasis of 250 uh, acres. It's a beautiful place. And those who have visited the spot tell of its beauty. From a fountain 600 feet above the sea flows a sparkling stream that tumbles down to the desert. There are five waterfalls, pools of crystal clear water, luxurious foliage is there, and colorful flowers. The oasis is reached by a steep pathway only for the sure-footed. David's rest and recreation in the haven of Engedi was short-lived, though. Chapter 24 begins that after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told that here is where he is. And so Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and he set out to look for David and his men near the crags, the cliffs of the wild goats. It's not surprising that when one travels, there's a need for a rescue. So King Saul found a cave, but he didn't realize that in this cave was David and his hundreds of men. It's, it's got to be a large cave. And so here we see David's opportunity to take revenge. And what happens? So they come hunting him, and again, David describes his enemies in Psalm 57 as ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears of arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. What we really find in this psalm is not David hiding from his enemies in the cave. The title to the psalm says that when he fled from Saul in the cave, but rather David hiding in God. And how does he do that? How does he hide in God? Saul came to the sheep pins beside the road. The cave was there and he went in. David and his men were hiding in the back of the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. As you wish. You can't find that promise recorded anywhere. And what does as you wish mean anyway? As you wish to David's men meant get back, get even, give him what he deserves. Like David's men, many people have friends like that who will gladly give that kind of advice and many good reasons to do so. Like maybe this, that, you know, he needs to be taught a lesson. Give him a taste of his own medicine. And you'll never respect yourself as long as you let him run over you like that. And like David's men, they might even bring, these friends might bring God into it. After all, God gave you certain rights, they might say. Or God certainly doesn't expect you to act like a doormat. So what did David do? His men thought that they had persuaded him. And so he crawls toward the front with a knife in his hand. And you know, David, here he is. He's feeling the pressure, conforming to the social pressure of all of his men. It's going to be a convenient time to, to get even. 
But something gets in the way. It's called conscience. That's what happens. Then David crept uh, unnoticed. After the men argued for David to kill Saul, he took his knife. He crawled. He slipped off into the darkness toward Saul. And the men probably nudged each other. You know, he's going to get even now. And they were probably to hear it at, at, you know, a muffled sound of David killing Saul. They never heard it. Never heard anything. In fact, David got there, got near Saul. He cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And that's all he did. Why was that all he did? Maybe he already had in mind that he was going to prove to Saul that his intention was not to harm him at all. Maybe that's what he had in mind. Now his men had something else in mind. But the thing that got in the way was his conscience. And what happened to his conscience? What was it? Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. The text actually tells us why his, he was conscience stricken. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the, the anointed of the Lord. Now you look at that word, and you'll find that, that means that he is the Lord's Messiah. It means Messiah. Now, not the Messiah, but he was a Messiah. He was the Lord's anointed. We see in this how he was hiding in the Lord, taking refuge in him by having steadfast love to the Lord. And he was practicing God's wisdom in all of this. And so when we look at this psalm, Psalm 57 really describes all of this. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster is past. He takes refuge. He hides in God. And he mentions, he refers to God's wings, but that's also mentioned in Exodus chapter 19, where there's a commentary about it. In Exodus 19 verse 4, it's stated, that you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. In other words, these wings was, were God's deliverance for the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And David, his deliverance with these wings would be in using, and he's hiding in God, how is he hiding in God? Well, he's using God's wisdom. He does what is right. And after this victory, the refuge God provided may have allowed David to write this psalm, Psalm 57. And also we need to hide in our Savior too. We need to trust in him during the storms of life. We need his strength, his comfort, his safety, and his wisdom. So David took refuge or he hid in God using God's wisdom. He didn't do as this proverb says in Proverbs 24, 29. I'll do to him as he has done to me. I'll pay that man back for what he did. The Savior said, do not say that. And he didn't say it. He didn't do it. What did he do? He kept his eyes on God and his wisdom. Do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight preserve sound judgment and discretion. There will be life to you. There will be an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. Then you can lie down, not be afraid. Lie down in sweet sleep. So he kept his focus on God's wisdom. And here's how. Just some examples of this. A fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. If he was a fool, he would have attacked Saul. He would have tried to kill him. 
But a prudent man overlooks an insult. He had many insults to overlook, didn't he? Here's another one. A man's spirit, a man's wisdom, that is, gives him patience. It's really God's wisdom that he takes into his life. And he knows. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. And there were many offenses to overlook, weren't there? He who covers over an offense promotes love. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. To cover means to conceal or hide. It wasn't that David didn't remember the offenses. But he wasn't going to let Saul's mistreatment of him dictate what he was going to do. So he was going to be in control himself, not let, not let Saul's jealousy control him. He was covering the mistreatment. And so, let's look at those wise words, cover and overlook. David overlooks the hardship Saul brings to his life and keeps his focus on pleasing God. I've made an acronym out of cover. And in this acronym, we see God's wisdom being used by David. Let's work our way back through what happened with this acronym. He was concerned with the C. He was concerned with doing what was right. And then he saw what happened with, with Saul in the cave as an opportunity to give goodwill. Not kill him, but to give goodwill. He valued God's judgment. He was going to let God take vengeance on him. It was his place to do that. And then he exemplified his innocence by what he did that day. He respected God and his anointed, the king. And so let's look at these five factors. Notice the first one that he was concerned with doing what was right. He was convicted that he was not going to to harm the Lord's anointed. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Remember, he snuck toward Saul. He only took part of, cut part of the robe. He came back. And his men were ready to kill him. Not only did he have to keep himself from killing him, but he had to keep his men from killing him. That's what he did. And he saw this as an opportunity to give goodwill to Saul. What follows could be, a, could be David's mini seminar, M I N I seminar, on how to confront someone who hurts you. David was not mean, he wasn't ugly, but rather, he was doing what was right. He wasn't going to do anything to someone who was harming him. He was controlled and he was respectful. So he wasn't mean and ugly, but he was controlled and respectful. And he called the king, my lord. Then David went out of the cave, called out to Saul, my lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face the ground. He was showing control and respect by doing that. And he valued God's judgment. Vengeance was going to be left to God. May the Lord judge between me and you and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. What David did was an example for us to follow, in a, in a sense, following the example of Jesus. What did Jesus do? Remember how Peter puts it? He said, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable for God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and only deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. One of the sins, isn't that what David is doing? He is committing himself 
and entrusting himself to God, his steadfast love, and his wisdom. And he's using that wisdom. He exemplified his innocence. Just as the Psalm 57 says, he was vindicated. Verse 2 states that I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, he's saying to Saul, but you are hunting me down to take my life. Well, how are we to fight back against wrongs done against us? Well, here's how Peter would put it. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day you visit. That kind of got messed up, didn't it? But we are to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse us of doing wrong, that the accusers of doing wrong, that they may see our good deeds and then end up glorifying God. In other words, we can win them over by doing good deeds. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. You know, that sounds like a really good response on the part of Saul. And I think that it was heartfelt. And he was really affected by what David had done that day. But David was not ready to trust him. Those were wonderful words, but they have to be confirmed with actions on the part of Saul. And guess what? Here we are reading about this in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And it's just two chapters later. Here he is pursuing David again. He's a fugitive again. He's running for his life after, after Saul had said all those things. So he couldn't trust him. Jealousy is a powerful force to overcome. And Saul didn't do it. And so we can see all of these characteristics that he exhibited. Yes, David respected God in all of this. And in showing God respect, he gave goodwill to Saul. We see respect in Psalm 57. Kind of a little summary of that psalm. David is telling of his problems and his difficulties to God. Or he's singing them. And he trusts in God with steadfast love. And he praises God for his love and his faithfulness. Because he made it through it, didn't he? Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. We can summarize this whole lesson with the following words from Jesus' Sermon on the Plain is recorded in Luke. And so if you don't remember anything else from this lesson, you just remember what Jesus said. Love your enemies. Do good to them. That's it. Love your enemies. Do good to them. I want to add one more thing about the, the wisdom that he was using, David was using. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom, which is God's wisdom, will reward you. And David was rewarded, wasn't he? He lived, he became king, and he was king for 40 years. So let's strive to do what Jesus says. Love your enemies, do good to them. 
let's use God's wisdom. And let's get closer to Jesus. It's Jesus' wisdom. If you haven't come to Jesus, if you haven't met him in the waters of baptism where he meets you as your master and your savior and washes your sins away, or whatever might be your need this morning, once you come as we stand and as we sing. While I was thinking, did you sing? Why don't I